Hello and welcome. Thank you. What the fuck? We'll just restart that. Here we go. Hello and welcome to Threes a Crime, a true crime podcast. I'm Tori. I'm Emily. And I'm Lindsay. And that's our intro. Here we are. We are professional. <laughs> professional podcasters. We're podcasters, bitches. Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Shit, Sorry. Just, okay. That was my... Oh, well, say, I thought you were looking at me and waiting. Uh, yeah, you... Uh, well, you tell... You tell... You. I don't want to fucking do it anymore. Well, no, you've ruined it. No. Oh, no. We're fighting. We're not podcasters anymore. You know what? Let's let Lindsay do it. Oh, <gasps> Lindsay! <laughs> We got a Patreon on the Patreon. Patreon. Thank you, Rebecca. Rebecca Thank Showers. You. She used to be a customer of mine when I was um, in the banking industry. Um, and I just loved her so much and love her even more now. No, I'm just kidding. I do. I love her more now. But no, thank you, you Rebecca. Um, we thank really... You. Rebecca showers bring May flowers. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, she does. Yes, she does. Oh. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. And we have... I pulled another card. We have a card today. Another, another card. card. This is from Rebecca Campbell. Work your light. Oracle card guidebook and it's trust the niggle Niggle. Mm, what an odd word what is the niggling feeling and that's n-i-g-g-l-e that is what niggle is niggle okay i've never heard that word it's like a like i have that niggling feeling of like like nagging nagging that's what i was thinking okay yeah got it the niggling is said a lot in this (laughs) okay (laughs) that niggling feeling that annoying, niggling feeling. That inconvenient, annoying, niggling feeling. Try as you might, it's there. And it ain't going anywhere. Most people spend years ignoring their niggling feelings. Throwing their best dollops of stubbornness, ego, and post-rationalization to numb them out. It's exhausting. Mm. And until you face the niggle, life just throws you more bait to awaken it. To draw your attention to the light within you that is bursting to come out. The niggle is an arrow pointing to what is standing in your way. The relationship, the conversation, the decision, the shift that needs to be made, the stone in your shoe. Often we feel the niggling feeling in our body first. Many people think that the intuition is something from the higher realms, but in fact it is the body that is the intuitive one. Working through our senses to deliver vibrational information. It takes just a moment every day to scan your body to receive the intuitive intelligence and act on it quickly. You're being called to face that niggle now. If you don't face it, the universe will throw something much bigger and more obvious in your path. And then you will likely regret that you didn't answer the niggle in the first place. I know it's scary, but you are safe. Our lunch today is we each ordered the exact same thing. (laughs) Yes, it's same. We had the same coffee from Starbucks. Pretty. Venti salted caramel Pretty. cold brew. And we each got uh, a Dr. G's gourmet burger from Down River Grill. And it's yeah. covered in delicious looking it's, shit. If you live in Spokane, I personally feel like it is the best burger in Spokane. Um, we also got their house beignets, which are divine. So thank you, Down River, for making amazing food. Thanks, Down River Grill. Thanks, Jamie from Down River. I love you. What does she do there? She's a waitress. Oh, cool. So tip her well the next time you're in there if yeah. you yes. have her as a server. Jamie. And tell tell her that Three's a Crime sent you. Tell them Three's a Crime sent you. Whether Get she's 10% a waitress or not. off. I'm just kidding. Yeah. We can't offer you a Sponsor us, code. please.
We got the puppy again. So yeah, we have the puppy again. Noises. Yeah, so sorry if you hear her in the background. Michael said that he thought she was really funny. I was like, that's good, because <laughs> yeah. I was worried that people were going to be annoyed. But she, she had, you know, she had to make her feelings known about certain things. But again, her name is Kalahari. She's a fat coat. She's up for adoption. I also have another dog up for adoption. I have a boxer mix whose name is Sherlock. He's between nine to ten months old. He is the sweetest dog in the entire world. And he's such a good, good, good boy. And he's completely housebroken and he'll be fully vaccinated and fixed this week. Um, and he will be available for adoption. And I will post a picture of him on Instagram. Instagram. Because he's a really freaking beautiful dog. And I saved him with the help of many others. It wasn't just me, but a community of rescuers got together and saved him from euthanasia. He was going to be put down the day we picked him up. From where in time? Uh, do you know? Nooses? Uh, uh, N-E-U-C-E-S County? I don't know. It's uh, South Texas. So Texas listeners, please let me know how you actually pronounce that. Um, but it's down by Corpus Christi. So he's named Sherlock because... The original woman who found him and posted him and drove four and a half hours each way to get him from Austin. Her name is Lisa Sherlock. And uh-huh. we actually ended up pulling another dog that was supposed to be put down that day who was seven months old. And we named him Watson because Sherlock and Watson. What else are you going to name this dog? Mm-hmm. Um, and he was fostered by an amazing woman in Texas named Krista. And he just got adopted yesterday. Oh, my gosh. So now it's Sherlock's Yay. turn. So now it's Sherlock's turn. And I, I lived in Austin um, for three years. And Austin is a bit better. But Texas as a whole... Like, you need to get your shit together Houston, when it comes to animals. Houston, you have a problem. Rio Grande Valley, you have a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I know this is our... I, I pers- but I think animal cruelty is a crime. It and, is. And um, there's, there's just a lot of it going on. So, Path of Hope was actually just in Houston. Um, if you go to their website... Um, you'll be able to watch some of the videos that they posted from down there, but I warn you. It's pretty terrible. <laughs> it's, have, it's really terrible. It. Um, so I am going to be partnering with another rescue uh, up here because I don't have enough to do. Um, <laughs> Seriously. But I'm going to be partnering with another rescue up here to try to bring more, um, more dogs up from Texas. So if you are local, and by local I mean Washington, northern Idaho area, and want to foster that you can DM me about. Slide into the DMs. Slide into her DMs. That's right. Um, but only fosters. Do we want to shout out our international listeners? Yes, yes. we do. So, Lindsay, do you want to start shouting out? I want to shout. So, Ireland. Ireland. I see you. Yes. And I love you. You're my favorite. I keep an eye out for you every time I release an episode. It's one yes. Ireland. We have one, one Irish, Irish listener. <laughs> we love you. Share us I with want your to know who you are. Yeah. And yeah. send us obsessed with you. Send us an Irish story. We would love oh to do God. it. Yes, I would love that. I mean, all of our international listeners. And, yes. and uh Emily will read them off here in a second. But um send us something from your country and we would love to cover that uh so canada the uk australia which i love after Catherine. so basically the commonwealth (laughs) yeah pretty much uh we have three italian listeners two german two mexico one united arab emirates one hungary one ireland and one india okay so uh bonjour oh we didn't have french (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, You're anyway. All right. Hello. Hello. <laughs> so, Ola. Ola. And um, I took three years of fucking Italian, and I'm like, <laughs> it's bonjour. Buongiorno. 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 Do you know that you. Kira is fluent in German? No. Yeah, that's, she talk. has a master's in German and math because she's a sociopath. Is that it? Oh, God. Guten Tag, enough? yeah. The literal English translations for the fucking words that they have are like perfection. <laughs> so, uh, oh my God, I have to remember this. So the owner of Michael's business is a woman and her husband's name is Hans and he is from Austria. And he um, told me that the Austrian word for gloves is Hanschwa. Which literally translates into hand shoes. 
<laughs> and I know it's not funny. And Tori, not Tori, uh, blah, blah, blah. Kira, who is fluent in German, I can't remember the word for squirrel, but it literally translates to like tiny running tree friend or something <laughs> like that. You need it's to tell like, my mom that she loves her goddamn squirrels right now. Emil Meat Pockets, <laughs> our producer, <laughs> would really like it if somebody would send her. You know, like because on on our so we have a new web we have a new website um, that we'll be launching here really soon. And we need uh, to explain Meat it, Pockets too. It's never been explained on, on here. It, no, that's our producer. Our producer's name. But we're is not going to like explain no, why. No, I don't think we need to. <laughs> okay. Um. Anyway, so. On the on the website, there's a thing you can do um, called buy me a coffee. Have you seen that? Like you can do that for. I've seen that with like actually restaurants. You can pay to buy the staff a beer after the after yeah. work. So what? something like that. Yeah, you can pay like fifteen bucks for like I a. Love that. Yeah. And so um, anyway, there's a buy me a coffee. So Emil Meat Pockets, our uh, producer, would really like it if you would send uh, some shrimp bisque instead of a coffee. The other two of us would prefer coffee. But yeah. um, mom yeah. would like the shrimp bisque. Mom loves the shrimps. I have an espresso machine at my house. She made make, you think delicious. But I love the coffee. Coffee. I get. I'm one of those people that has become numb to it now. Mm. See, what where we, I'm like, oh, it's just a coffee machine. Yeah, pick me up one, even though I can literally pick the same thing at home. Maybe what we should do is start putting our order in with you. I know, and then I can just bring it. Even on the way here, Michael was like, "Do you want me to bring you a coffee?" Or do you want me? To, he always offers to make me one before I leave. I'm like, no, Lindsay's picking it up, and he's like, <laughs> I could just. Why okay. are you guys? Yeah, he's like, okay. Um, the other big thing that happened this week is Lindsay made our demo merch cups, and um, they're so cool. <laughs> they're we will so definitely cool. be posting pictures of them. So they have our logo on one side, and then and they're personalized. They to are us. personalized. We need to tell them meat pockets. All right. <laughs> So I cool. wanted to create an air of mystery, but that's fine. I mean, it's pretty not mysterious. I had meat in my pockets. <laughs> Just call them the meat pockets. <laughs> and I wish I could say it was like beef jerky or something like dry, you know, that you can like, no, it was like full on like slices of steak, steak. Yeah. in my fucking pocket wrapped up in a napkin. But explain why you okay. had meat in your pocket. So we were just talking about Path of Hope. So last year I was there with them for the retreat where you would go and you'd tour these shelters and you'd street feed and you'd talk to people about vaccinating their dogs and all these things. And we went to a restaurant and this place paid for our food and it was a Korean barbecue place. So they'd bring out a bunch of raw food and you'd cook it like right in front of you. It was like, Oh, there was probably 40 of us at that restaurant. Like it was outrageous. There was a ton of us. And yeah, you, we were cooking it and then they just keep bringing it out. Cause there's so many of us there. And when we went to leave, I was like, oh, can we, like, take this? Because we cooked it. And they told me no. And I said, that is trash. (laughs) I would like to take this. So I grabbed a napkin and some handfuls of meat and put it into my pocket. And then went to a shelter. Yes. However, as I was walking by, every dog was like <laughs> But let's be let's make it clear that Emily did not put this meat in her pockets to like save it for me. Oh later. yeah, it was four dogs. It was I feel like <laughs> Like, well, I thought it was stupid. I couldn't take it, so I just filled my pocket. Yeah, they wouldn't give me a to-go container, oh so I filled my pocket. It was just pieces of cooked steak, and I was like, I'm just going to literally take some and put it in my pocket because I didn't have a purse. I would have put it in my purse. But I brought it because you, street feeding, you just go to a giant field and, like, coax these dogs to, like, come out from Wherever bushes and under out. cars and stuff. And so all of us had, like, treats, and I, I didn't really realize it until... I, I, it's on camera, actually. If you watch one of the videos, uh, Kane Corso walked up to me, which if you don't know what kind of dog that is, it's like, beautiful. Dog. it's like my dream dog. It's like huge, massive mm. bear of an animal. Mm-hmm. I have a picture of him. I'll post it. It was so cute. And he walked up and he sniffed my pocket and I talked to his owner and he had a great owner. And so I gave the Kane Corso my pocket full of meat. <laughs> And there are like 30 people and I remember Caitlin is like filming and everyone's asking questions and I'm just like, <laughs> <laughs> just like I'm just like feeding this dog. 
Yeah, I'll find a picture and I'll post it on Instagram. He was adorable. That's really funny. <laughs> so my name is Emil Meat Pockets now. And I don't remember the Emil, I think, came from some yeah, sort of typo. From? I think it was, it was a typo, typo in our in our group chat that we <laughs> And then she I think it was me and then Emil said a me like she Emil. took it and then Emil uh, and so it became Emil. Uh, my cousin used to call me enemy and I've also been called Elemy. And then Emil was. I think I was just trying to say your name all in caps about something. Emil. Yeah. Emil. 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 Yes. So that's how I got my name. Emily is our producer. That's my name, and She's I'm sticking to it. I got here. Wait, look. Look at this. Look at this fucking dog. Oh. oh. Tell me that you don't want to give him pockets full of meat. Oh I would definitely God. give so him cute. pockets full of meat. He was so huge. Um, I just got a an alert from Postmates that said, "Save a horse, ride a taco." <laughs> I've never Postmates. used Postmates. Uh, Brittany used it, and they fucked up our order, and she tried to say, like, hey, you fucked up my order, and had, like, a traumatic experience, and was ne- she couldn't contact them. She would oh, say, like, hey, no. you fucked up my order, and they just gave her, like, a like a credit. She was like, I don't want a credit. Like, this is pissing me off that I can't tell you that you fucked yeah. up my order. Like, I don't want to use this again. And then they blocked her from everything, and now she's... <laughs> We tried to get order food from her house the other night. We had to use it on my account because it blocked her. So I try not to use Postmates because I'm a little pissed at them. And if you read all the reviews, everyone's like, yeah, there's like no one to contact. I'm pretty sure Postmates is not going to sponsor us. But that's okay. Probably not now. That's okay. I mean, they banned my friend. We thought they banned her address at first. We thought they wouldn't even like deliver to her address. <laughs> that's Ooh. awesome and one of the many reasons why we love Brittany yeah um, I know I was just gonna say you, you might want to explain who Brittany is Brittany because she's been mentioned is my times. broski and she I met her through the rescue actually mm-hmm. I meet everybody through the rescue I met her through the rescue we roomed together in Houston last year and then I thought bitch I like you mm-hmm. and now we're best bros whether she wants to be or not <laughs> Emily decides that she likes you. It's just all downhill from there. You're done. You can't, you know. She's like catching the hurt. You are. (laughs) I am. You said I could run a cult. And like, I really feel like I've taken that into my soul. That was really funny. Yeah. Emily once posted like just an open question on Facebook. that was like, from what you know, from what you know of me, what would be like, what would be the job I should be doing? And my response was cult leader. Yeah. (laughs) I think I take that as a compliment. I take you it should. as a compliment. Because I said, she can talk Hard anybody. Work. She is an amazing salesman. I can talk woman. anyone into anything. Yeah, I can sell really eyes can. to an Eskimo. She really can. Okay, this is this has gone off the rails. <laughs> it has. It's gone completely off the rails. I'm sorry. You know, poor Lindsay, like, just so everybody knows, like, Emily and I are aware <laughs> that we talk over <laughs> Lindsay. We just railroad and each her other. and each other. We're working on it. Um, and the thing is, because Lindsay is so polite, she will just stop talking. Just, I am. I am. <laughs> Where Emily and I will just talk over each other. That's true. We're aware of it. We're working on we're it. We're doing I'm our best. I'm getting better at asserting yeah. myself. So we're doing better at taking a step back. So we're going to learn about Hotel Cecil. Yeah. Is it the Cecil Cecil Hotel or Hotel Cecil? Technically, it's the Hotel Cecil, but people just call it the Cecil Hotel. Okay. And I'll just call it the Hotel or Cecil. I'm really excited about this. I've done so much research. So much research on this. this. I'm so excited. And this is not going to be like a recap of the Netflix documentary. And no. this is not Elise Lamb. This is just this is actually about the hotel itself. Yes, because I was much more interested in that because I couldn't find. You can't find a lot of stuff about it, so I had to look in a lot of different places. And it was a lot less on the documentary than I thought. Yeah. I thought it. Mm-hmm. I didn't think it would be an Elisa Lamb documentary. I thought it would be a Hotel Cecil, and also this weird thing. Yeah, happened. that's what I was hoping. Yeah, it was not a lot of information. No, really <clears> about it. No, it really. There's. I mean, and there's just so much shit. To do. Okay. I'm excited. Well, I am ready to hear it, man. I'm gonna sit back. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Well, yeah. So I'm gonna give all the information, then we're gonna have a special guest. The special guest will discuss the ghost adventures episode and the paranormal. Sweet. So the history Cecil begun construction in nineteen twenty four by three ho- hoteliers. Hotel Hotel yard ho- three people who do <laughs> hotels. <laughs> Three dudes who build hotels. Two yeah. fucking guys. Oh. It's like, but it doesn't sound right. It's like anyway. pianist. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it just got me. <laughs> it's like an 
obviously knew what you were trying to say, but for some reason I thought you were saying penis really funny. I thought you were like, just like how you say penis. And I was like, no, no. you said pianist. It, but that's how, it, that's the correct way to say it, is pianist. It's I know, pianist, but I pianist. didn't hear the T at the end. Was- <laughs> so it just was like... <laughs> <laughs> the three hoteliers. We got William Banks, Hannah, Charles L. Bix, and Robert H. Shops. <laughs> it was designed by Lloyd Lester Smith. And in the style of the Beau Ar- Beau Arts, help me. Beau Arts, which is this fancy architectural style and taught in Paris. It was used a shit ton from the 1830s to the end of the 19th century. So it's pretty much sculptural decoration with modern lines. That reminds me of like the Great Gatsby, whatever. Yes. But I yes. can't remember what that's called. It's called Beau Arts. But it has like a different. I know new, new, Nouveau. Nouveau. Art Nouveau. Nouveau. Art Nouveau. Is that what it is? Art Nouveau. Yes. Yeah. The gold straight lines. Yes. Yeah. So like this style, for example, is like a flat roof, arch windows, grand entrances, staircases, murals, super beautiful yep. fancy shit with a lot of marble. And the lobby is all, quote, opulent marble with stained glass windows and alabaster statues. And I obviously haven't stayed there, but um, if I had <laughs> walked into this opulent lobby and then they're like, OK, you may go to your room and you get to your room and it's like. And you see what you saw in the documentary. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, or, or you're sitting on like, you know, one of those plastic seats that's at hand. <laughs> <laughs> I talk about this later, Sorry. but in every fucking picture, there is that fucking hand, hand, chair, hand chair, and it's dented, so they just use the same one. In oh, like that's so <laughs> terrible. That's so weird because um, this particular week, I'm on a Facebook group that's like weird secondhand finds. Like, so people post like the amazing and weird stuff that they get at thrift stores or whatever. And that hand chair has popped up like three oh, no. times this week because someone found one and then another guy was like, curse the universe. Like, why do I never find a hand chair? <laughs> and then the next day, his neighbor texted him and like literally there was a hand chair that somebody had put out for the oh, trash. Man. This reminds me of hand chua. <laughs> hand chua. Hand chua. Hand shoes. <laughs> Oh, hand, hand chair, hand shoes. Hand gloves. chair, hand shoes. So in 1924, the hotel was built for $1.5 million, and then, which today would be $22.2 million. Well, and it's funny because um, with the Han story, yeah, which if you're not a Patreon, sorry. Sorry. Um, but with the, the Han story, he built his house, well, the house was 50, no, $70,000 to build, and then he put in an additional 50,000. 50, and that's the same year. So, like, the inflation difference yes. in essentially what was 100 years ago minus 397. Wow, math. <laughs> Maths. Math. That's insane. Yeah. it's That's so much money. 22 million. That's like, yeah, which is why people don't want to let it go. Yeah. It's wild. Yeah. Oh my God, all the marble and everything. Yeah. It's a historical landmark now. Mm-hmm. So they can't fuck it up too much anymore. But no, so he's still in South Carolina. And you know, they the houses are really famous there. There's a yeah. set called Rainbow Row. And um, those people, like, they can never change the paint color mm-hmm. of their house. And I mean, they have to get like the same paint. And, like, any changes that you make, you basically have to make with the materials. Well, yeah, to be approved and stuff, but, like, you have to. Like, 17 signatures for you can, like, paint a wall in your house. Uh Oh, my God. Seriously. I couldn't handle that. No, I don't. I couldn't, like, never live to a place that has an HOA because I'm like, no, you will not. Fuck no. You don't get to tell me (laughs) what I do with my my house. Brittany's the president of the HOA. I don't know. Because of course she because is. Because of course she is. I don't even know her and I love it. She is like... If you're going to be in an HOA, that's the only position you can. That's what she said. She said the guy who was yeah. running hated dogs. And she ran... Spe- I think he said that you had to... Oh, maybe he's going to make a pit bull ban or something like Ooh. that. And she was like, so I ran specifically for that and I won. So, <laughs> here we are. That's amazing. Yeah. That's she's awesome. like a hundred... Like, she just... Mm. You'll meet her one day. I'm excited. She does everything. She's really good at everything. Asshole. <laughs> Who's up? Okay. People say the hotel opened in 1924, but that's when it began. Began? Mm-hmm. Began construction. So it opened in 1927. 
It has 15 floors and 700 guest rooms. It, the hotel was built as a destination for business travelers and tourists, but soon after it was built, the Great Depression came and fucked all that shit up. So during that same time, there was a gaggle of hotels being built in that area when Cecil was opened. So is Cecil like one of the first? Yeah. It's just, it's so crazy that they she built is. this. Why do you <laughs> It, it. <laughs> <laughs> He's Sorry. like, why? You would keep you from laughing at me. <laughs> we ruined everything. <laughs> 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 Every time. Every time. I know. It was know. not intentional. Oh my god, I know. <laughs> oh, we have to view ourselves because we're such assholes. <laughs> That was the only way poor Lindsay could get a sentence off. She has not had one sentence. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm just hyper aware of it now. <laughs> Sorry. But no, I was just thinking like, okay, so it costs $1.2 or $22 million to build this hotel. It was only open for a few years, and then it was the Great Depression. Yeah, terrible. Like, I can't yeah. believe that the hotel is still, still around. there. This area, so where the Cecil is, it's that area of downtown LA is zoned residential. Okay, so then... Um, so, since this area was zoned residential, when the Depression hit, it became full of transient seasonal workers, and since the, they were residential, they became homes for the people who were passing through or working temporarily. So this whole shit show leads us to Skid Row. Don't, don't. Yep, that's what... <laughs> I have a quote about how to kind of explain Skid Row. So, quote, starting in the early 1900s, in many of the cities working poor, unemployed, disabled, or otherwise, marginalized residents found homes in this area because of the single room occupancy hotels. Right. So the whole neighborhood. Yeah. The, the whole area. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Okay. Skid okay. Row. In the 1930s, during the Depression, Skid Row was home to over 10,000 homeless people. Wow. And Skid Row, it's a neighborhood in downtown LA that covers 50 city blocks. That's it. It sounds a lot, a lot but it's really, really not. So, in 1947, LAPD Chief Clements B. Horrell, I don't know how far you say that. Clements B. Horrell. He ordered a shit show asshole move <laughs> called a blockade raid because they claim that 50% of the crime in LA originated in Skid Row. Mm. So, their solution was to arrest over 350 people. Jeez. And apparently, the LAPD claimed that the crime was lower in that air- area after the raid. But. In 1956, the city of Los Angeles tried to, quote-unquote, rehabilitate the area by demolishing decaying buildings. Mm. So the city presented this idea to the hotel and building, hold on, to the hotel and building owners are saying, this is what I wrote, okay, quote, look, bro, shit will be cheaper if you just knock that building down (laughs) instead of trying to fix the whole building then all them peoples, all those peoples will leave. These people then knock down the buildings down to save money and to clear the area. But all this did was just force everyone out onto the sidewalks and streets. Yeah. I mean, so now you've taken, like, you've, you've taken, taken you their just home. Moved. Yeah. Yeah, you just moved and them so, to just moved area. them somewhere else. Like, you know, place. now they are homeless, but they're not going to leave. So okay. there were 15,000 buildings in Skid, Skid Row, and then it dropped to 7,500. So then in 1976, the city unofficially made Skid Row the containment zone where shelters and services for homeless people were to be tolerated. In 1987, they wanted to raid the fucking area again. Like, you know, like, that's it's... the thing. They, they forced these people there. And then they now that there's them. now that there's a way to profit from that area, yep. now they're being raided for being in the area that they were forced into in the first place. Yep. And you know, this is the same thing we did to the Native Americans. Yeah. You know, we would give them a reservation, which we gave them their own land and made sure it was the shittiest possible land. Yep. 
Um, but then if, say, oil rights were found, we take it back. And we don't, like, I'm not talking about people not honoring the Treaty of 1867. I'm talking, like, current day. Oh, yeah. You know, if we want, you know, if we want something. um, I actually went to a reservation in Allegheny. Uh, Oh, this is in Pennsylvania. Oh. Yeah, so we we had gone to visit this reservation. Um, We went up to tour the reservation, and they took us through this area where, you know, it was, like, all kinds of pre-fab yeah. houses. And later, the the girl was telling us that the 60s, when Kennedy was running for president, he had actually gone out and met with a bunch of Native American tribes oh. and asked them to vote for him. I mean, they're sovereign nations within our country. Yeah. And so, on the reservations are. And so, most of them didn't vote in our elections. But they went out in droves for Kennedy. And one of the things about... um the reservation that I was at, the government was coming in and wanted to build a dam. Mm-hmm. And that dam was going to disrupt their ancient <laughs> burial grounds, which I don't I don't why I'm giggling at that. It's just always like it haunted houses or, you know, exactly. on top of. But Kennedy had promised that if they voted for him, that he would stop that dam from going through. And then, of course, they went out. They voted. He won. But he had no, but even after, it, like, yeah. it didn't really have anything to do with his assassination. He didn't fulfill his <laughs> promise. And they went in and they dug up that, like, there was, I remember her telling us that there was one anthropologist that was running around and, like, trying to, and I mean, you're talking about a place, you know, or a, a, a culture that lives on oral tradition. But she had said, you know, people will say, well, look at all these houses they bought you, because that was kind of they made their reparations and sorry we're taking more of your land um and kennedy lied to you but you know here we'll help and we'll build some houses she was like we would rather have our history anyway that was a crazy sidebar story so then i said thank fuck for la city attorney and future mayor james k hahn which i thought that oh was God. interesting it's our fourth haunt. I know. He was like, fuck that quote. This is quote. <laughs> Not the fuck that, just the <laughs> after is his quote. <laughs> <laughs> he's not he's not going to prosecute individuals for not having a place to stay he simply will not prosecute people for being poor unpri- underprivileged and unable to find a place to sleep until I'm convinced that a viable alternative to sleeping on the streets exists hell oh, yeah that's bro. wild yeah so in 76 yeah oh no wait 87 that was 87. still still yeah and so that that's whole nice. thing fell through and that didn't happen in 2005 it was discovered that hospitals and hospitals hospitals <laughs> hospitals hospitals and law enforcement they were dumping homeless people on skid row quote instead of arranging for a post-treatment plan hospitals discarded the chronically ill and homeless back to the street where they were swallowed up again by the black hole that is Skid Row. So from 2000 to present, it's been a constant battle between the city and Skid Row. In 2019, the population of the area was uh, 4,757. It's one of the largest homeless populations in the U.S. And I said, like, I knew that society truly has such apathy towards the poor and homeless, but this area is such a magnified version of that so pretty much what all of that has to do with the cecil is the hotels literally on the edge of where skid row is centered within this 50 block area there's there's a lot of violence and crime and because it's so concentrated it's just fucking shit show so you have this giant fancy fucking hotel that is now home to many of the skid row residents along with People just staying there visiting. It is a, it's just it is a, a shit crazy show. Crazy mishmash, yeah, of society from absolutely you know those that are kind of hurting the most to just like rich, people yeah. from Wisconsin who right. just want to visit and they want like, to so, save money. So weird. I just picture somebody from like the Midwest and just being like. <laughs> I'm here from Wisconsin. I wanted to come to the big city and see what it was like. It's like Axl Rose when it comes to L.A. from, what's that video? 
where he come, gets off the bus. Fuck. I'm I so know sorry. Everybody's everybody's yelling. Yelling. Welcome to the jungle. I think it's that one. In Letter Kenny, they make fun of how people say LA. And this is an entire episode about saying LA. <laughs> LA has the best tacos. <laughs> and I can't hear LA without LA. saying LA in my brain. I've never wrong. been to LA. Have the best tacos. <laughs> They're not wrong. No, not wrong. Does LA really have the best tacos? No. I think San Diego, if you're talking about... Oh, they're not wrong about how people say it. Oh, my... <laughs> no, so you're yeah. like, the, no. They're not wrong. No. LA what about the does tacos? have the best LA tacos. LA has the... Uh, when I went there and I stayed in that place by fucking Skid Row, right by the Staples Center, they, yeah. I didn't get any... I was so looking forward to the food and it was like all a disappointment. Like, it was mm. fine. But it was like... But when I was in San Diego... I had, like, lobster tacos. I, when I went to a place where, like, a local person, I stayed with a local girl, and I was like, where do I go? She's like, bitch, well, that's let me fucking the take you. Yeah. to do that. Yeah. yeah. But L.A. was like, me. Now, your, your um, dad lives in California. Mm-hmm. Hi, so dad. Yes. Hi, dad. Know. Hi, dad. And his wife, Barbara. Barb. He's actually from California, and he moved up here forever ago. And then when I turned 18, we moved back down. Have you, do you live um, in L.A.? Have you been to L.A.? Yeah, that was my question. Oh, yeah, I've been to... L.A. quite a bit. West Hollywood quite a bit. Born and raised. <laughs> Did the same thing in my head. It's like you were in there. <laughs> you said it as I was thinking. So weird. <laughs> Sorry. But California has, I mean, they. it's pretty good competition, I think, with Washington when it comes to serial killers. Yes, so, I would agree. You know, yes. it would be really fun is if we got enough patrons, we could do, like, the, the Oregon, California coast and just do a whole thing where we stop and investigate oh sites yes. all the way down and then back. So, in 2007, some new owners took the hotel over and refurbished a part of the hotel. Uh, and then I, I wrote, I'm not sure what part, but I'm thinking it's probably the fancy rooms for traveling guests. <laughs> yeah. I think that's a pretty safe assumption. Yeah. In 2011, they rebranded part of the hotel as Stay on Main. And they were trying to change the perception of the hotel. The fucking fuck. <laughs> it's only a two star hotel. Well, yeah, because people are murdered. I know. Because <laughs> if you look, at if really... you look up, I was trying to look up pictures of like the rooms, and yeah. it's just called the Stay on Main now. It's not called Hotel Cecil. Yeah. But I just think it's funny that it has stars. Two. It's three point one out of five stars, but it's only a two star hotel, and it just well. So the people that didn't get murdered or have their lives ruined or whatever, putting in good Yelp reviews. <laughs> you know what? I could it. see her doing that <laughs> for <laughs> hours and hours. Yeah. Yeah. Have you seen the pictures that said like, find someone who looks at you the way this lady, or find someone <laughs> who talks about you the way that she talks about the Cecil it's so hotel? True. But yeah, I mean, she yeah, that was the only time she showed any emotion, and it was just like such a weird. She struck me as the type of person who came on to like to like set the record straight right. that someone was trying. And is she, kind of the vibe I she was did getting. An interview with E, I think. Oh or... yeah, I think I saw that. And that that was because yeah, that was, was in the yeah, um, was, in that video she, about the body language. She knows. She knows. She knows something. Yeah, she and won't say because her answers were not cohesive, and she's mm. just kept going. But, uh, they were t- okay, so they rebranded with Stay on Main, and they were trying to change the perception of the hotel to fun time with orange bright colors and a modern look. I tell you what, when I see orange in hotels, I like that it is that is not the feeling that it is. No. Every time me. I see bright no. colors, I immediately think this is such a hipster hotel. I love it. <laughs> I like this was made for some. This was made for millennials. And what did you say? Twenty seventeen. No, well, twenty eleven. Yeah. Twenty. Well, yeah, twenty eleven. So, I mean, I was eighteen. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you you were. The I would target. have seen you that and been. That, yeah. I would have been like, this is such a cool old building, but like the inside is all renovated. We have to stay here. I wrote nothing says says a shit ton of people didn't die here like orange and those <laughs> stupid chairs that look like a hand. <laughs> And then I say, please, please Google Hotel Cecil. Look at the pictures that are still up of what the rooms they oh, renovated yeah, so look like. It looks like postgraduate housing. <laughs> yeah. Like, like a dorm room. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. With the rebranding part of the hotel, they created separate reception areas during the day. So like there was the modern stay on Main and then they had the Cecil part. But everyone at night shared the same community bathrooms, which there were community bathrooms. Not a lot of them didn't have individual 
And they all shared the same hallways and elevators and everything. In 2014, the hotel was sold to New York hotel buyer dude, Richard. Uh, He bought it for $30 million. And then a development company got a 99-year ground lease for the building. So... In 2016, the president of the development company stated that they're going to preserve the historical parts of the hotel, but gut out and redo the rest of the rooms. So the renovation planned, like, a gym, a lounge, and a fucking rooftop pool. Like, Which is so creepy. So fucking tacky. Well, and the thing is, like, how are, like, they need the water tanks that are up there, and it's not the kind of roof where a rooftop Pool no. It was not a cute anyway. rooftop. It was no. a very like this is the Industrial. top of the building rooftop yeah. where they someone gets stuck in a water tank. Decided this mm-hmm. after she died, right? I oh, mean, that's so it's, weird. It's like in and of itself is kind of a in poor like taste, distasteful. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's like a fuck you. So then in 2017, <laughs> the hotel, the hotel, hotel was shut down so they could work on it. And then the same year, the hotel was deemed a historical cult cultural monument it's still shut down and not being used it's not being worked on it's just sitting so after all the history i'm going to go into the documented deaths and then i wrote i feel like with all this history as the building was just being kind of born and built into the world darkness sadness like stale stagnant energy found a home Mm. there Mm. i feel this all leads us to 19 documented suicides and murders. 19. 19 documented. So the first person to pass was January 22nd, 1927. He's age 52. Is Percy Ormond Cook. That's my family's last name. Oh, great. That's my mom's maiden name. What if we're related? Good champagne for $4. Percy wrote a, a note addressed to the press. Money cannot buy happiness. I have tried it, and I find that it cannot be done. I have lost my wife, my son, and my home, and I am doing the only thing left for me to do. Oh, that's sad. He was a real estate agent, and he was separated from his son and wife for several months. He was tired and just had enough, and felt like the only escape was suicide. He died of a gunshot to the head. November 19th, 1931, uh, age 46, is W.K. Norton. He was missing from his home in Manhattan Beach. That's where my dad's from. He was missing from his home in Manhattan Beach, but he was found dead at the hotel a week before he checked in. He checked into the hotel under the name James Willies of Chicago. A maid found him in his room. He had taken pills that contained poison. Third is in September 1932, age 25. Yeah. Benjamin Dodich. D-O-D-I-C-H. He was found dead by a maid from his self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. There was no note or much information on him. I want to say very quickly, there's a group of hooligan children. Oh yeah, I heard them. Do you see? They're all sitting oh, on the nice. on the grassy no- oh, grassy yeah. knoll. On the grassy knoll. Yep. There is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and like ten bicycles. So you know what? If you hear children being children. I live, yeah, I live across from an elementary school. That's okay. They all look like they have sodas. They're not being hooligans yet. Not They're yet. being good children. July 1934, Sergeant Louis D. Borden. He was a sergeant in the mili- in the Army Medical Corps. He was found dead in his room. He slashed his throat with a razor. And he left Ooh. several notes. And one of them talked about his poor health for being the reason for suicide. March 15th, 1937, Grace E. Margot, age 25. She fell from the ninth story window of her room. Police were unable to determine if she jumped or was pushed. Quote, telephone wires ripped from poles in her descent were entangled about her body. She was staying at the hotel with her partner, M.W. Madison. He was asleep at the time and had no idea why she jumped or what happened. <laughs> January 10th, 1938, Roy Thompson, age 35, he was a Marine. Roy left no suicide note. The police determined that he jumped from the 14th story of his hotel room and was found on top of a skylight on the neighboring building. He had stayed at the hotel for several weeks. 
we had a sergeant in the army and then we had a marine and now we have a navy kind of in a row so then may 1939 erwin c neblett age 39 he was a navy radio man second class his body was found by a maid and he died from strychnine poisoning strychnine is just like a i try to look it up it's just it's like poison. what would be in like rat poison Yes, um, it is what, yes, that's what's in rat poison. Okay, January 12th, 1940, Dorothy Seeger, age 45, she was a teacher and had ingested poison when she was staying at the hotel. She was taken to the local hospital but died on January 12th, died the same day. This is another Dorothy. And then I wrote, this one is oof. 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 Dorothy was staying in a room at the hotel with her boyfriend, Ben Levine. He was asleep when she realized she was going into labor. Oh, God. She was unaware that she was even pregnant. <gasps> oh, Wait, my God. I, so, I find that so hard to I it's believe, Yeah. But, okay. So on this floor, there was a communal bathroom. So she went to the bathroom, not waking Ben, and had a baby boy. Oh, my God. He was asleep this whole time. How did he, was how completely, he sleep through labor? Well, he went and she left the room. I went to a communal bathroom down the hall. She had a baby boy, and she thought the baby was dead. So she threw him out the window. <gasps> oh, my God. And he landed on the room uh, no. room near the building. No. Okay, well, I was I didn't see that one coming. No. Sorry, Oma. That one? Was I'm not going to apologize that for. One was... Oh, my God. She thought it was oh dead, so she threw it out oh the window? Oh, my God. And he was alive. Is it getting worse? Alive. No, it's just pretty much... After she did that, she said nothing to her boyfriend. Like, Ben had, like, no, had no idea. So, eventually, Dorothy was charged with murder, but there were three psychiatrists that testified at her trial that she was mentally confused when she killed her child. In January of 1945, she was found not guilty by reason of insanity. Because she was like, there's been no issues. There was nothing. How the fuck? Well, I mean, if you're susceptible, this place like feeds on your fear, on your just your low that low energy vibe, low vibration. Of just fear. Yeah. In November 1947, Robert Smith, not as a cure, right? Robert Smith, <laughs> yeah, mm. not as a cure. Age 35, he died from jumping out of the seventh floor window. October 23rd, 1954, Helen Gurney, age 55. Helen checked into the hotel as Margaret Brown one week prior to her death. She jumped from a seventh floor window and landed on top of the Cecil's marquee. In the newspaper article, it said, quote, hundreds of spectators gathered as firemen and ambulance attendants put a ladder up to the marquee and lowered the body. Right after this, the police were, call- were called nearby to help a man who completely lost his shit after seeing all of this. His oh, name yeah. was Melvin Hinckley, and he was a ministry student. He was taken to the hospital shortly after for observation. <laughs> February 11, 1962, Julia Frances Moore, age 50, she de- jumped to her death from an eighth floor window. She left no notes, but police found her name and information in her purse, but her purse also held just 59 cents with her bank book. Mm. On October 12, 1962, Pauline Auden was age 27, and George Giannini, Giannini, I'm age 65. (laughs) So these deaths happened together, but not on purpose. Pauline was having marital issues with her estranged husband, fucking Dewey. Fucking Dewey. They had a fight, and Dewey left for dinner, leaving her in the room. After he left, she jumped from the window of her ninth floor room. Her body fell on George as he was <gasps> walking on the sidewalk. What? Oh, I did hear that one. Below the window. I, yeah. So did she oh, time it? No, or it just, it just random. He was walking, right? It was just like the random, like random That's shit. It's so... like some final destination. Just... Yeah. Seriously. This death is not directly in the hotel. In 1963, Delbert Lawrence, he jumped to his death from a 13th floor of a downtown hotel but landed in the parking lot behind the Cecil. Okay, so this one is pretty well known. June 4th, 1964, K. Jackie E. Ellinger or Pigeon Goldie Osgood. Pigeon Goldie! She died on June 4th, 1964. Okay, so there's not tons of information. 
But this is what I could find to share her story because she sounded like an amazing, sassy, lovely lady. Goldie was a telephone operator in the 1900s. And I couldn't find if she had a husband or kids. So in 1958, Goldie came to the Cecil alone at the age of 59. Her pension was probably just enough for her to barely survive and live at the Cecil. The hotel was where many elders could live cheaply and stay long term. So Goldie was extremely popular and well-loved in the hotel and the neighborhood community. Every day Goldie would walk to Pershing Square with her classic blue L.A. Dodgers hat and a bag of bird seed at her feet. Mm. And she would pee, feed, she'd pee on them. she peed on them. <laughs> she'd the birds. <laughs> she would feed them for hours. A quote from the L.A. Times. Pigeon Goldie, the kindly woman who had visited Pershing Square daily to feed birds too small to forage for themselves, and she would scare she would scare away the larger birds which threatened her favorites. That's, That's like the so lady pure. from Home Alone too. Yeah. That's the most wholesome story I've ever heard. And that's why she was called Pigeon Goldie. All right, here we go. Here comes this God damn part. it. No, I don't want to hear it. Goldie was found dead by a man who was distributing phone books to the hotel rooms. The murderer strangled her with one of the hotel's hand towels. Oh my God. Her room had been ransacked. Her hat and bird seeds strewn all over the room. She oh. was stabbed, beaten, and raped. Her killer oh was never found. I was really wow. hoping that it was just going to be like, the staff found her after a week, you know? Like, not that she not that had to go, go through all that. that. Sorry, Goldie. Uh, December 20th, 1975, Allison Lowell, age 23. A woman jumped from the 12th floor, floor window. Her identity is still unidentified, but she checked into the Cecil under Allison Lowell. <laughs> September 1st, 1992. There's, there's a big That's a gap. Big gap. I didn't even realize that. What's the last one? 1975. 70... 70, so, September 1st, 90, 90, 1992. <laughs> A, the age of Voltron. <laughs> Voltron. <laughs> okay, the police found a body of an African American man in the alley behind the hotel. He was in the age of twenty to thirty. They believed he was either pushed or jumped from the fifteenth floor, but he is also unidentified. And then it jumps to twenty third February nineteenth, twenty thirteen, the Lisa Lamb. I'll just give the basic details since this case has been investigated by all of everybody. Uh, Elisa was found naked inside one of the water supply tanks on the top of the Cecil Hotel. She had been missing since January 31st, 2013. A maintenance worker found her body when he was checking the tanks uh, because guests were complaining that the water was fucking <sighs> gross. That so skeeps me oh, out. And I the mean, pressure was low. People were brushing their teeth. They were drinking. They were, they were showering. In it. I don't drink water from hotels anyway. No, I always buy yeah. bottled water, but especially because we're spoiled here, we have really good water. Right. Such good water here. There's uh, an aquifer right below us. I was told from a guy from the Bronx. I asked him. He had a very thick. Bronx accent. He was the guy that I rented our floor sander when we redid our floor. And I said, your accent is so badass. You're obviously from New York. And I said, what, what, I said, what's something different in Spokane and what makes New York pizza so good? And he said, the difference with Spokane and New York is we're all obsessed with our dogs. <laughs> he literally said, I came here and I saw them like every day and everyone's walking them. And I was literally wearing this shirt. And he's like, and literally, I mean, people wear them on their shirts and like, it, just not used to it. But he said the water in New York tastes different and he swears up and down that the water in the pizza dough is what makes new york pizza new york pizza i have heard from i think i was listening to a podcast and they said that people love new york water mm. but she fucking hates it she doesn't understand she thinks it's full of mold but <laughs> okay so, but yeah, cool. we'll i've heard that patrons. So, okay, the elevator video showed her acting weird and not like herself before she disappeared. Later authorities ruled her death as next old drowning. If you want to know more about this, just check out the many YouTube videos, documentaries, documentaries, and the newest docuseries on Netflix. It does explain Elisa Lam really well. It just doesn't explain any of Hotel Cecil really well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. No, they definitely glossed, glossed, over, glossed over it. Yeah. 
And then the last documented death is June 13th, 2015. He was age 28. The body of a male was found outside the hotel. They suspect that the person committed suicide by jumping from the hotel. That's an awful lot of suicide in one place. So with all the deaths, the majority being suicide, the hotel is nicknamed the suicide by people who lived in the hotel. And the hotel became known for having violence, weird shit happening, cheating couples, drugs, and rooms used by sex workers, and that whole thing. And I wrote, all right. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the deaths that have been documented at the hotel. When I was doing research, I found that Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, did not visit the hotel. The day before she was found murdered. Not what I thought you were going to say. According to LAPD files and Black Dahlia historians, Elizabeth was last seen at the Biltmore. And the Biltmore Hotel, Los Angeles, is about a 12-minute walk to Cecil. I think that's a whole... That whole shit show didn't have to do with that whole shit show. (laughs) Okay. Now we're moving on to who stayed at the hotel. So, famous guests? Yeah. Infamous. Infamous. Yeah. Infamous guests. Uh-huh. Now let's talk a little bit about Ghostbusters. <laughs> Ghostbusters. <laughs> because of course we should. Of course. My Ooh, brain is, I wrote like, my brain is 85% pop, pop, pop culture TV movie non-shit. 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 Pop non-shit, culture non-shit. TV movie and non-shit. <laughs> <laughs> and so the more I was receiving, re- oh my god. <laughs> Hold on. If Hold on. Let me take me a neither. drink of my see- bang. Energy. Of her delish strawberry kiss. <laughs> I'm just going to keep going until they sponsor us. Okay, so the more I was researching and doing all this shit, I realized that the Cecil is almost like the real life version of the possess- pos- possessed and fucked up apartment building in the movie. So the Shandor in the movie. Wait, which movie is this? Ghostbusters. Oh, in Go- <laughs> Duh. Oh my fucking... <laughs> So I've never seen that. The sh- is she serious? Yeah, I know. I was just thinking. She won't if- look at me because she knows well, I, was, I have on my face right thinking, now. Oh, no. I've never. And you were talking about Home Alone. I've never seen Home Alone either. There's a lot of movies I haven't seen. I know I'm a freak. I know. You're I'm the worst just- pop culture friend to have because I don't know what I don't know any of it. That's just something you have to learn. Yeah, <sighs> you'll Especially have to learn busters. me. I feel like Ghost maybe Busters is like one of my favorite movies. I feel yeah. like that was on on the cruise for some reason because they played movies outdoors like at nighttime. Probably. It's like a and they had like Spider- the new Spider Man and then they also had like some older movies and I want to say one of them was Ghostbusters but I was mostly drunk on that trip so I can't tell you if I watched it or not. Ghostbusters. Okay, so the Shandor, which is the building in the movie. It's a, also known as Spook Central, as Dan Aykroyd called it. Called okay. it. So you know Dan Aykroyd. Yeah. Oh, so, but Dan Aykroyd's another one that we got to talk about sometime because he's yes. got a big, huge well, connection to the paranormal. Like it is yeah. the family he's business. A good, he's a good he, guy, right? Yeah, yes. Talk okay, about good because I love him. Oh my god, Lindsay, I'm so sorry. <laughs> one, I have one question. Did you see that Morbid did a uh, interview with Rain Wilson? No. Yeah. About a new movie that he's doing, some something something, and they have a on there. That was a great shout out for that movie. It's called something something. <laughs> well, I, the PR work. <laughs> Listen, the PR work. Listen, their PR did a Rogan. I do not fucking need this from you. <laughs> I don't know. Morbid nice. podcast. Listen to us. The apartment. Uh, the so Egon. He's uh from the movie as well, and he's like the brainiac guy. He, um, Played by the incredible um, uh, Ra- uh, Harold Ramis. Yes. I, like, it <laughs> couldn't get them started. Harold Ramis, who passed so away. He had this to say about the building in the movie. The whole building is a huge, super conductive antenna that was designed and built expressively, expressively, expressly for the purpose <laughs> of pulling in and concentrating. Sp- <laughs> just fuck that. <laughs> All right. The whole building is a huge, super conductive antenna that was designed and built expressly for the purpose of pulling in and, and concentrating spiritual turbulence. So it's pretty much the Shandor is what the building in the movie is called. It has a history of fucked up rituals done by a cult of Gozer in worship of Gozer on the roof. So, Ooh. like, stuff in the movie happens on the roof. 
And it's just, it felt like it's also its own fucking conductor of energy and all mm. this shit that's like swirling around. So it really like, my point being, since Dan Aykroyd <laughs> is Dan Aykroyd and into aliens and into the paranormal super hardcore, I wonder if he used Cecil as, at all as an inspiration for the Ghostbusters building. Interesting. Dan Aykroyd, hit us up. Let us know. <laughs> Did Dan Aykroyd, was he like responsible for... He wrote, he wrote it. Like, Shut up. It, it's all based on real... Mm-hmm. Like, go. Uh, I think they made up Gozer because they didn't want people to start worshipping the real oh, okay. entity. But he huh. is all into that. I didn't know that Dan Aykroyd made Ghostbusters. You can watch one of the um, movies that made us. They did it and you'll learn all about yeah. Ghostbusters. Okay. It was, seriously is one of my all-time favorite movies. Yes. And so it hurts my heart. That, <laughs> then I haven't seen it. That you ha- and I'm listening to Lindsay very... <laughs> she has to explain like, literally every detail to me because I don't but, know what she's talking about. But she's about. still doing it, and you would know this, but she's still doing it in a way where she's like not... Like she's not spoiling it for you in case you watch it. So it's like the spoiler-free yeah. version. Spoiler-free version. Yeah. Of what happened in Ghostbusters. Just, just Sigourney Weaver just... Mm. Oh, so good. Who is that? I'm just kidding. I totally know who Sigourney yeah, Weaver is. I'm kidding. Oh my god. You need to calm your fucking tits, okay? <laughs> so much glare. So That's much. Like one of Bren's loves. So be like, I'm going to tell Bren. I'll see you later. Oh. I mean, I grew up with Snick. Like in my teens. Snick? What is that? Saturday night. Nickelodeon Saturday night. I remember Still, like Nick like, at night. Different. Not the same thing. Okay. Well. This was like are you afraid of the dark? Okay. What was the show uh, where? Camp out of Wana. Silver was... Sharks. Pink Pete, Pete. Sorry. I'm sorry. Those are the recognized. <laughs> Red and Stimpy. Red oh. and Stimpy, I knew. Yeah. I didn't like those though. I wasn't in. Or like Cartoon Network, I also wasn't I was a little into. old for Red and Stimpy. I did love the Powerpuff Girls. I do say that they're redoing the Powerpuff Girls into a drama, kind of. No. Whoa. Yeah, they showed the actresses. I'm like, oh, fuck, these people are. I feel old now. I don't know who they are. All right, so now we're going to go for the serial killers slash assholes who stayed at the hotel, further infecting the icky energy of the hotel and with more ick and shit. <laughs> ick and shit. Okay, so I said by now you probably know that Richard Ramirez, a.k.a. Halitosis Dick. That was my joke. That was mine. I was really proud of that. <laughs> Not Dr. Dick, Halitosis Dick. Yeah. He stayed at the hotel for a couple weeks during his killing spree. Um, We probably won't cover him because he's been researched and talked about. He's so Richard much. Ramirez. Yeah. yeah. If you don't know Richard Ramirez, check yourself. Yeah. So if you want to learn more, I, of course, recommend last podcast on the left, episodes 110 and 11. Night Stalker documentary. Yes, the Night Stalker documentary on Netflix is really good, too. So this is just like a little baby summary. Ramirez's childhood and early life is the perfect how to create a serious psychopath Mm -hmm. who will then become a serial killer for dummies. He didn't have a chance. No. No. He he didn't have a chance. Not at all. That is not defending him. (laughs) No. That's just. He was a serial killer, serial rapist, burglar, and pedophile. Between June 1984 to August of 1984, he went on a killing spree from L.A. to San Francisco. Nope, I'm not allowed to do that. My mom told me. Jesus yeah. Muhammad. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> that didn't Jesus work. Muhammad. It was, oh, my Muhammad was what it was. She said, right? No, she's, no. She, she said, said, you don't hear people yeah, say. Yeah, you don't. You don't hear people use other deities. My mother asked me not to use the Lord's name in vain, and I'm trying to be respectful. Um, but she had made the point that, that Jesus is the most common swear word. I have no idea if that's true. So I don't want to get comments and emails about how that's not true. But it makes sense. I'm like, yeah, you know, I can see that. Like, I say Jesus Christ or whatever. But you but you never hear people say, like, Buddha. <laughs> oh, my Buddha. <laughs> I'm gonna now. I know. That's right. every time I say, oh, my God, I think I want to say, oh, my Muhammad. Oh. Yes. Oh, my <laughs> Or whatever you said. <laughs> Instead of saved. Jesus Christ. She just looked at me and went, Jesus, Jesus Muhammad. <laughs> We're going to get fired from podcasting. <laughs> oh my Trust. God. The, the problem is, is that is one area where we all do try to be respectful. We're just trying to tell a story. I know. And not 
And it's like, like we're just we're just trying to let Lindsay tell it. Uh, no, and we cannot help ourselves. So what is I wrong can't. with us? So did you know he was also known as the Night Stalker? Oh, That's what? <laughs> also known as the Night Stalker. Richard. Richard from Beerus. Oh, you are backing <laughs> up that far? <laughs> oh, that was where she was. It was Richard from Beerus. She never got into Richard from Beerus. Yeah, we didn't even hear about him. Yeah, we suck. <laughs> we <laughs> suck. <laughs> You're going back so that far? <laughs> Just to clarify, though, he's the Night Stalker. Um, and then, yeah, it's a right. Stalker. But I just want to be clear because Joseph D'Angelo or whatever his name was, so they call him the original mm. Night Stalker because oh. he had like eight different names. He was the, the East Side Rapist, da 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 da. But one of his names is the, the original, original Night, Night Stalker, Stalker, which is not the same. When you were when you said D'Angelo, I was like, what? The singer, the man with the D'Angelo. <laughs> And then I realized what you said. Okay. Okay, so he lived in a room on the top floor of the Cecil. He paid only $14 a night to stay there. After committing his murders and crimes, he would throw his bloody clothes into a hotel dumpster and then just stroll on into the lobby in his panties and or naked. Either one. And, like, that didn't raise any eyebrows, apparently. Well, I mean... Look what's around. I know, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. It's like, $14 I saw there was a naked night. guy walking around the fucking... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he claimed to worship the devil and love that whole vibe. He claimed to be a Satanist. He's but such a fucking he loser. He was used the imagery, imagery to fuck with people. True Satanism is not that. Do you so, know his other nickname is the Walk-In Killer? What a lame ass name. The Walk-In Killer. Sorry for the one who came up with that. Like at the <laughs> it's newspapers. Not good. Yeah, no. Away. The walk in. That's yeah. what people typically do is you walk into a home. I crawl in. <laughs> I roll in. I just roll. I in. slither like a snake. <laughs> <laughs> it's said that he performed evil rituals and shit in his room at the hotel, but I couldn't find any info on that, but probably. The asshole was arrested and given the death penalty, but he died in 2013. Jeez, of complications wow. from B cell lymphoma. I love it when serial killers get cancer. Like, he they're died. the only people that should. There's but it's really interesting. Like, a lot of serial killers seem to die by cancer. Yes. Like well, I mean, when you're so fucking evil and gross, you, it, it your insides come back at you. Yeah. It rocks you from the inside. Elisa Lamb died February of 2013. Richard died June of 2013. I just thought that was really weird. I wonder if there's any, like, woo-woo theory that Ramirez's spirit killed Lisa We'll, we'll Lamb. find out in Ghost Adventures. Oh really? Oh, I'm excited. That sounded like a, like a setup, and it was not. That was yeah, that <laughs> was I, exciting. Yeah. Okay, go on. So he died, and then <laughs> <laughs> the next asshole who stayed at the hotel was Johan. Yes. Unter Unterweger. His name yeah. is Jack. His nickname was Jack. I'm just gonna call him Jack because I'm gonna, not gonna yeah. try to. He was okay. Good. Yeah. He was a serial killer from Austria. Who murdered sex workers in, throughout different countries? So I went into detail for this yes. for you. you I, I requested. I requested Lindsay look into this guy. I remember. So Jack was born in 1950 to a Viennese bartender and waitress, and an American soldier, Jack Becker. And also, some other sources say his mom was a sex worker. But okay, so she was arrested and jailed for fraud while she was pregnant with Jack and had him after she was released from jail. In 1953, she was arrested again and he was sent to live with his abusive grandfather. One source called his grandpa a rough fellow and he said, and he used Jack to help him steal farm animals. So <laughs> that's a weird grandfather grandson. Uh, yeah. Body Activity. experience. Yeah. Throughout his young life, he was in and out of prison for assaulting sex sex workers. Between 1966 and 1947, he was convicted 16 times. See, I mean, oh. most were theft convictions, but he was also convicted of pimping and sexual assault against a sex worker. 16 fucking times, you're like... Okay, so in 1974, he murdered 18-year-old German Margaret Schaefer by strangling her with her own bra. In 1976, he was sentenced to life in prison in Austria. So during his stay in jail, he became a writer, and apparently everyone loved that shit. He wrote short, short stories, plays, poems, and an autobiography. This is the title of his book. Jeez. Purgatory. 
or the trip to person. Person? God damn it. <laughs> Purgatory or the trip to prison. Report to the guilty man. <laughs> so did he write that after he was in prison? He wrote it in prison. So here's a quote. Ugh. No theme is more poetic than the death of a beautiful woman. Uterberger wrote at one point. Another of his odes went, You still seem strange and distant and lively, death. But one day you will be close and full of flames. Come, lava, there. I am there. Take me, I'm yours! <laughs> They always right. think they can fucking write poetry and it's always god awful. Bad. Bullshit. Bad. Oh, so in 1985, a campaign began, began <laughs> to release and pardon him from prison. Who was. Who? who? The know. Austrian president refused to release him until he served a minimum of 15 years. Apparently, writers, artists, journalists, and politicians all asked for him to be, be released early. That's okay. First of all, that's entirely messed up. But so he served prison in Austria. Did he serve yes. prison any in any of the other countries like New that York has, City? Where that hasn't happened yet. Oh, oh, yeah. So he had been he in just prison. Killed one sex worker, in, and they were like, uh, "Okay, you have to serve at least that. fifteen." In nineteen ninety, he was released after serving the minimum fifteen years. And was thought to be rehabbed and all fixed up. No more murdering for him. And his fucking autobiography was taught in schools. And they performed his stories on Austrian radio. He no. hosted TV shows. What? Talking about crim criminal rehabilitation. And worked as a reporter for a public channel. He reported on crimes in Austria. Uh, God, fuck. Austria. On crimes in Austria that he later would commit himself okay so this is so crazy can you imagine like being the co-worker like if, if you had a co-worker that you knew had murdered someone by choice like not in self-defense not just does just because i felt like it and then he was in for 15 years and then just was out yep and then, and then he, he became a celebrity. basically famous i don't like this. So later, when he's captured, authorities find out that he killed six sex workers in Austria in 1990 after he was released and it was so called all fixed up. Using what soon becomes his signature way of killing by strangling the women with her breasts. That's just one more reason not to wear one. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. In 91, he's hired by an Austrian magazine to write about how sex work is viewed and treated in the U.S. compared to Europe. So this asshole has done the research on this shit already, so it shouldn't be a problem. And in June 91, Jack went to L.A. and chose the Cecil because Ramirez stayed there and he wanted to study how Ramirez worked. I mean, I guess you could say hindsight is twenty twenty, but... As the owner of a paper, you're going to send someone who is convicted of murdering the sex worker to go, to go research. Yeah. I still feel like that newspaper that oh, sent yeah. him has blood on their hands. Absolutely. Like they, oh, for, you know, for oh, revenue people. or whatever. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they made, I mean, well, I guess assuming that, well, no, because they knew because he had been a celebrity for being in prison for, yeah. for murdering a sex worker. And so you knew when you sent him, that's like you're sending a murderer to a place where in yeah. sex workers are. Eighty four, the American Horror Story. The fact yes. that that chick is like lets the guy, lets the guy. Sorry, you guys haven't seen that one, but it's a year old, so whatever. This one chick is pretending to be somebody else, but she's a psychologist, and she lets a serial killer out because she wanted to see how he like hunted in his natural behavior or natural natural habitat. habitat. Yeah. But that's, I mean, that's basically what they did. Yeah, that's very true. So while in L.A., he went on several several ride-alongs with the police and wrote some articles basically about Hollywood sex workers. Fuck this guy. While murdering them. Okay. I fucking yeah. hate this guy. So during his five-week stay in L.A., while at the Cecil, he'll, he killed three sex workers. His first victim was 35-year-old Shannon Exley, who was found in Boyle Heights on June 20th. Do you think he got per diem? Like, do you think they gave him money to go, like, to pay? Absolutely. Yeah. Like, you were paid yeah. to go kill people. Like, yeah. I'm, sh yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 
processing. I can't. Oh, like, yeah. what are you doing? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. I just, I don't understand. Like, I just, sorry. I'm sorry. You're I just fine. don't understand. And that's why Can that hotel has somebody. blood on their hands because they knew the that hotel they were sending or the magazine. The magazine. The magazine. Like, yes. they knew that they were sending yeah. somebody who had done this before. That is so gross. Wow. Yeah. The second victim was 33-year-old Irene Rodriguez. She was found in the same neighborhood 10 days later. And then Peggy Booth, age 26, was found dead in a Malibu Canyon on July 10th. All the women were sex workers. They had all been savagely beaten, sexually violated with tree branches, and then strangled with their own bras. There are some accounts of a fourth victim in San Diego, but they never brought any charges against him for that. And I couldn't find anything. I mean, and there could be more. So when Interpol noticed how close the L.A. murders matched Jack's M.O., he was already back in Austria in February of 1992. Extra shook about the fact that he came from another country. Like, I didn't put that together. Like, they sent him across the fucking ocean. Mm -hmm. An Austrian man. let him loose. To come to our country. Any country, but, like, this, like, he came here and killed. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just can't. He's back in Austria. So an Austrian SWAT team raided Jack's apartment, but he was already long gone. Quote, embarked with his teenage lover on a jaunt that would take him through Switzerland, France, and Canada. And back once more to the United States. Uh, During the time that he was running from the police, he would call the Austrian media saying how he was innocent and would taunt the police at the same time. Eventually, yeah, he just fucked with everybody. Eventually they found him. And his girlfriend in Miami, and he was arrested. His girlfriend told the police that they went to Miami because Jack liked Don Johnson, one of the stars of Miami oh Vice. Oh my God. It's the only reason he was there. <laughs> After oh, yeah, being captured, Jack was accused of killing 11 sex workers since he was released from Austria. Oh, from prison. Oh, wow. There were six in Austria, three in the U.S., and two in Czechoslovakia. You should not be able to kill people in multiple countries. You shouldn't be able to kill anyone at all. But, like, you should not have the opportunity to kill people in Czechoslovakia, America, and Austria after you get out of prison for being caught for it the first time. Like, that. I fucking hate this guy. I hate this guy. I'm getting, like, mad about it. I'm like, I fucking hate this man. Is he alive? Thank God. Austria and the U.S. fought over who got to deal with him. Well, Czech peaced out and said no thanks. <laughs> Czech was not wanting to deal with that shit. Yeah. Well, they were having their own issues. Austria won when they agreed to include the murders in the U.S. along with the six in Austria. So that he, this all yeah. happened back then in Austria. So in Austria, he was indicted on 11 murders, but with some legal shit, the trial was delayed for almost two years. So on April 20th, 1994, the trial began and only lasted for two months. FBI experts from Quantico tested, testified in his trial against him. The whole time he just smiled and was trying to charm the press. But as the evidence piled up against him, he was convicted on June 28th of nine murders, but was, was acquitted of the two of two others. He was sentenced to life maximum ma, life in maximum security on June 29th. <laughs> Jesus Christ. He was found dead hanging from a curtain rod in his cell with a drawstring from his sweatpants around his neck. Fucking coward. Yep. I mean, there's an end game with a 15 year sentence. Maybe he literally was just like, all I gotta do is serve 15 years. Right. I'll have out. great behavior. I'm and I'll smart get enough. They'll yeah. never catch me. Yeah. Versus a life sentence. I mean. Yeah. Well, and then, bitch. you know, the thing that I hate about that it, when they commit suicide is that they're taking control mm-hmm. of when, you know, yeah, exactly. Like they're taking they, that away from the victim. Yes. By Exactly. That's it for this part. Okay, part one. And then the Which ghost adventures and the, it's already our guest. <laughs> you can follow us on Instagram at Threes a Crime, email us at threes a crime at gmail dot com, listen wherever you get your podcast. And to support Threes a Crime and our adventures, visit our link tree in our Instagram bio.